the first thing for you should should be like create a top of funnel on LinkedIn where you become an authority figure in the type of transformative coaching that you offer. I'm not productive nine to five. I'm productive like maybe two hours at a time. And when I graduated university, I went right to work for the family business and I got fired within a month. <laughs> Welcome to today's episode of Next Big Wave. Today I'm joined by Nikon Gormley. Nikon is a Thai American founder in uh, Thailand and Bangkok. Uh, Nikon and I met a while back at a networking event, and Nikon introduced me to his mastermind, which I've since then joined. Uh, but on his daytime job, uh, Nikon is a business coach, people transformation speaker, founder, and national public radio host. So he keeps himself busy, and I'm super excited to have you on board today to walk us through the whole process of how you got to where you are and how you manage your time, man. That's a lot of things to juggle. But anyways, Nikon, welcome. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim, for having me. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here. I'm a big fan of your podcast and the energy you bring to your conversations is so like captivating and it makes watching and listening to you a real joy well i really appreciate it nikon and you know you and i have had a lot of off the record conversations so i know i can be a little outspoken so i yeah. still appreciate you coming on the show and not being too worried about what we're going to discuss uh nikon so you know i i just went through a list of things that you do and for most people it's difficult to focus on one thing so Let's start with how do you manage doing so many things? Because I think that's the, the really exciting thing to learn from you. Right. So if you look at my LinkedIn, right, it's like, wow, that guy's doing a lot. You know, business coaching, doing people transformation for corporates, being a founder of business, having a national public radio host. You know, for me, it's going to sound weird. I, I have a hard time doing only one thing. Like if you just made me do only one thing, I think I would have, I would be really frustrated. I have, I have this, I think my attention span, I like doing a lot of different things. I like jumping to different things and most, and like traditional productivity and attention like, oh, you're not focused. You have to only focus on one thing. The way it looks to me is because I have a lot to do or a lot to focus on, I'm never giving myself a hard time on one thing. Meaning like usually when I get stuck on one thing and I'll go away to do the other thing, which clears up my mind about that one thing I was stuck on. So by the time I come back, my mind has settled and I'm able to be more creative and innovative. And so it's almost like my own built in system for myself of not getting too fixated on one thing and giving myself space for each thing that I approach. I just realized that talking to you. I love it. Every time we have a talk, you know, it's like we come up with realization. So I hope we come up with a lot during this yeah. podcast. It's a longer form conversation. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, though, is that, you know, when you and I met, one of the very few things, uh, very first things you mentioned was that basically you're really into Taekwondo, right? I don't know if you're a black belt. I don't even know how the belts work in Taekwondo, but you're, you're going to tell us all about that. And you immediately started talking about that and how that framework is something you adapt to your different enterprises and namely your mastermind. So can you walk us through that? Because I think Taekwondo is a big part of your life, right? So I think it's right. important to touch base on that. Right. So for context, for people who understand, for, for context, I have been doing Taekwondo for 25 years since I was 12 years old. I have a fifth Dan black belt. And next year I will be doing my sixth dan. And for context, it's like, you know, if you get to black belt, then it's first dan, second dan, third dan, fourth dan, fifth dan. And between every dan, you have to wait a number of years. So it's a very long process. And usually at the higher level, it becomes more about community and leadership and, and sharing Taekwondo. So an example of after you get your fourth dan, you have to wait four years for your fifth dan, and then you have to wait five years for your sixth and then six for your seventh. And it's designed that way to grow leaders to, to, you know, so you don't have like a 20 year old grandmaster, you know, they really want well-rounded leaders in their community. And that's why that exists. So for me, I think growing up, I didn't, I felt like I didn't have a lot of structure at home. And as a young boy, young man, I really crave that structure. 
And when I found Taekwondo, it was heaven. It was, there were belts, there were um, seniors, there were juniors, and the seniors would take care of the juniors and the juniors would take care of the next level. And there was this beautiful environment of mentorship, of coaching, of growth, of um, being better. You know, as, as good as you think you are, there's someone in your Taekwondo gym who's always going to kick your ass. But not in like a mean way, like, oh, you suck. I'm going to kick your ass. But like, here are your edges. Here are your blind spots. And so I always grew up in the environment of like, okay, there, there's something I can see better here. There's something I can be better at. And not... What I love about Taekwondo is, is looking back, it wasn't so much about like you yourself not being good enough, like, oh, I'm not good enough and, and I'm not um, I'm not enough. It was more of about the craft. You can always get better at your craft. Like what you think about yourself is very, that grows over time with confidence and self-realization. But like you can think the best of yourself and still suck at your craft. <laughs> Because you need to spend time and energy on your craft. So Taekwondo is really good at reminding you and keeping you humble. And how that relates to business is, is that, you know, when I think about it, I do take that a lot into business. I really focus on the craft. Like how, if I take myself out of the equation, if I stop worrying about myself and I really focus on the bare, like having a clear perspective of the business, like what, what can I, what can I do to make this better? How can we, sharpen this how can we refine this and that constant refinement just who knew who knew it makes for great business it not not never settling for like this is good enough like well it's good enough for now but how can we make this better how can we play a bigger game and and being really humble about it you know as in taekwondo funny thing is i would get bored when i was the best player in that gym i would get bored and i could just see myself shrink and I would just take myself to a better gym where kids were better and players were better because I knew that was the way I was going to be better. And similar to the mastermind, right? That, that, that's how that relates to the mastermind is being with myself and my teams and the founders. Of course, my, my team thinks I'm great because I pay them and I'm like the founder. So, but I want to put myself in a place where people are maybe more ahead in their journey or they're more in like have different depths and different areas of business. And I swear to you, the mastermind, I think everybody deserves to have a mastermind or create their own mastermind. Put yourself in a group of people where you're the least smartest person in the room. It's felt like a mini MBA. The things I've learned by listening to stories and war stories have have really changed the way I create and build businesses. Love it. And, and you've also created some Taekwondo gyms, right? So now, like, that's one of your businesses as well. Right. So what started as a hobby because I just really enjoy Taekwondo. I wanted to give it back to kids. And so I started teaching it at an international school 10 years ago. And fast forward 10 years now, we're teaching in 12 schools. We teach 500 kids a week. We have 20 staff across three different cities. And I grew that business not really, like I studied business, but I didn't know how, like really what I was doing, but it was really step by step and and getting stuck and asking questions and, and going away, learning information, learning how to do marketing, learning how to be a leader. And that was my, I think building a business was what has been one of my best teachers. And I recommend that for every founder, entrepreneur, the best way to learn how to build a business is to build a business, no matter how it goes. Yeah, I agree. Don't be afraid to, to fail. That's for sure. Uh, something we've all learned. So speaking of that, like, what's your actual journey? You know, uh, first of all, you're Thai American. How much time have you spent in either country? And also, how did you start out your career? Um, I'm very curious to get to how you became a founder eventually. Sure. So I grew up in Pattaya, Thailand. So I was born and raised in Pattaya. I spent the first 18 years of my life there. And I think being a founder was, I grew up with a lot of entrepreneurial things. So my father's a glass artist. So he does a lot of work with um, architects and interior designers doing very large projects for hotels and mostly hotels, mostly his main work has been hotels and big buildings, commercial buildings. And he's a self-taught glass artist and self-taught engineer and self-taught entrepreneur. And so watching that, and both agreeing with things and not agreeing with things, but in, I think more sheer like wonder, like how, how is this person doing this? You know, when 
everybody's telling you, you know, there's a right way to do things. And he's just doing it his way. My aunt, who is my father's sister, came to help my father build his glass business. And she had, she has a son. And at that time, her son was very young and her son was Caucasian, not Thai. And the story goes, she took her son to Thai school and the Thai school is like, where are your papers, your ID card, your house papers? And she said, well, he doesn't have any because he's white. He's not, he's not Asian. And they're like, oh, you can't go to school here, which is very Asian logic. Like, if you don't have the right papers, you cannot come here. So she said, cool, I will start my own school in my living room because she was a trained Montessori teacher. Mm. And so it's very, like the theme is very like, I will figure it out. I will do it on my own. So she built this school in her living room and then it expanded to over the years. It grew into a very large school, like 100 kids. And it became the Montessori. It's a big living room. So, yeah, the big living room. Right. And then it grew like as businesses, the better you do in business, the more like growth happens. And so she rented more space and all the expat kids in the neighborhood went to that school. Okay. And then it grew and grew. And then she, she, um, she started to hire staff and build her team. And, and one of her apprentices so was my nannies as a kid. And when it came time to, for her to leave Thailand and she moved back to America for her son, cause she just thought it was ready to move on. She gave that business to her apprentice with no strings attached, no equity, nothing back in the day. It's like, here, here's this business. And that apprentice rebuilt that business, re refigured, like re-systematized it. She got her PhD in education. And now that school probably has 800 kids in Pattaya wow. or more. It's a multi-million dollar business. Okay. And so I was in that and watched that. So I got to watch the power of mentorship. I got to watch the power of coaching. I got to watch the power of business building and what that can do to a life. Can you imagine like, like the lady who was my nanny, like she was like, her job is to be an au pair, if you will. And now she owns a multi-million dollar business as a teacher, educator, really important part. She's a really important part in the Padilla educational ecosystem. And she took, she would bring in people from up country to be teachers and change their lives. And for me, that really inspired me for impact. And so if career wise, so that, that was, that really influenced the, the, the beginnings, if you will. So I went to America to study business. Cause I, I thought, I thought my dad didn't know what he was doing. I was wrong. Of course, Cause I was like, that, to, right? yeah, All right. Cause there has to be a right way to do this. I'm going to go to the West to the top mm -hmm. business school and I'm going to come back and show you all. I was very wrong. <laughs> and because I think in business school, we spend a lot of time learning about theories and best practices. And I found out later that many of the professors were, were really great at teaching, but not a lot of them had real experiences building businesses, which came to a surprise. Fact, right? And I was like, oh, like I see, like, okay, you're a great teacher and you love studying business. And it would have been helpful to learn from people who actually built things. Yeah. And, Right. And then from that, I came back to Thailand and during my twenties, I just tried a bunch of stuff. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I know I wanted to do stuff. I tried working in a trading office. I tried working in finance. I tried working in property development, just a bunch of stuff. But in the background was this Taekwondo because I wanted to be a Taekwondo athlete and I started teaching Taekwondo. And then that was growing in the background. I joke with my team and that the Taekwondo business is the business I paid the least amount of attention to but it's the one that grew the most. And in many ways, maybe that's why it grew so, grew so well, because I didn't have this constant pressure and stress on it. It was just a natural growth over 10 years. Like I had no real goals for it to be any, like anything that it came to be today. And then, and then during university, I like during university, I, I spent a lot of time with my aunt who was an educator and I started really getting interested into psychology, psychiatry, personal development, spirituality, which was interesting, right? I'm at school learning business, but my hobby of studying is about the mind and how people work. And I, I studied everything I'd get my hands on. I got like books and courses and online courses. And then I started hiring coaches and that was really the inflection point in my learning when I realized I could hire professionals because in Asia, I think there's this real like hierarchy of teacher and student. 
Mm-hmm. And then in the West, I learned when you could hire professionals. And to me, this, this might be twisted, but this is the way it looks to me in my head is if I can hire this professional, this professional teacher now works for me and his or her job is to make me better. And that's the exchange, the transaction. And I thought, oh, okay, everybody's up for grabs now. I can just save my money. I can go hire my best, my, my favorite teachers or authors. I'm like, hey, <laughs> like, here's money. Teach me how to be good like you. And I would hire psychologists. I would hire psychiatrists. I would hire counselors who had 50 years experience. And I would just tell them, hey, uh, what's your hourly rate? I'd love to hire you to be my teacher. And I want you to teach me the best of what you know, of the best of what you know. And it really changed my my whole life because the relationship changed. Like they were really, um, I would call it engaged in making me a better person or making me a better better at my craft. Whereas like before and like asking people to be my mentors, it felt like I was begging for their time. Like, oh, hey, when you have a spare hour, can you please be my teacher? I was like, no, let's change this. You work for me now <laughs> and your job. I need you to be all in and making me grow to this next level. That's funny that you mentioned that because I've I've always felt the same way about mentors. I've never had one, uh, and I'm sure that's a that's a problem in itself. But I always felt guilty asking people for their time, but I also didn't know that you could pay to get basically access to anyone until very recently. And I think that mindset is shifting because very recently, as I've been active on LinkedIn, I also have a lot of students following me for some reason. I think students are always trying to learn, always trying to hustle. Like I do get asked for jobs and opportunities as well. But I've had several students who are in like second or third year of university saying, hey, I don't have much, but I'd be happy to pay for your time because I want to learn this and this and that, even if it's an hour or two. And I was like, wow, like when I was a student, it would have never come to my mind to offer to pay someone 15 years older than me to teach me something. So that's an interesting shift. And I think it's due to, for better or for worse, all the gurus online who are promoting this coaching and this and that. And now you kind of understand, like, you know, I'm thinking of like, the Grant Cardone and all those guys who are saying, I wanted to learn something. I paid $100,000 for the best guy for a week. And then I was just like miles ahead in my life. And of course, it's not to that proportion, but I think it's happening a lot more where people realize you can pay for knowledge way faster than having to go through university or read books and stuff like that. Right. And uh, to that point is one thing I learned is by hiring people directly, they're not under any constraints of the institution they're teaching at. Like they don't have to follow a curriculum. Like you're the curriculum, your needs, your goals, your no hopes and are, are like, that's the curriculum. That's where we're, that's the point of this and and to to your point about online guru it's like like in any industry across the board there are always people looking to make a quick buck and they're just not that good and you know taekwondo teachers are the same there are a lot of taekwondo teachers and most of them are not that good i would say this yeah i would say in this um in this industry the barrier to entry is very very low the barrier to success is extraordinarily high mm-hmm. uh, it takes i would say as a professional coach educator teacher probably about six years until i kind of knew what i was doing where i like okay i think i can i think i have like i can see what i'm doing now like i had to apologize to all my early clients like i'm so sorry i didn't know what i was doing like come back let me let me do this again like no don't worry about money it's just my apology. That's and another thing I love about you. And I learned that from you recently is that, you know, as you build, cause I'm building my own training program, right? As you're building, there are people like me who are obsessed about putting out the best content immediately, like as the first iteration. And then I spoke to you and you said, no, just put out whatever you have right now, iterate, improve it. And then apologize to people that maybe you didn't have the best thing and they'll uh, accept it. And you've done it countless times, I guess. Yeah. And I, I love that philosophy now. So I'm going to apply it to my own stuff as well. Yeah. And it, it's for me, it's if you do that, you'll you'll be way ahead of the game because there's an authenticity about that, about a teacher who 
who is willing to say, you know what, this is what I'm seeing right now. It might not be the best or at the top of the mountain. There is no top of the mountain. And for me, I just, I've always gravitated toward teachers like that because I felt in a way, in a weird way, I felt more safe with them than, than with people who are like, this is the best, this is the best of everything I know. Because in my own journey, I've learned that we're always seeing more. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to spend time with teachers who are at the edge of what they're seeing and they're willing to, to share. Appreciate that. So just to go back to everything you're doing right now, you're yeah, yeah. Ve- very well-rounded individual, but where do you spend your time the most? Like, how do you break down your time? Because that's something I'm very curious right. about. So this may seem, uh, in, a weird, in, in a way, this is like in our off-the-record session, you said something recently in a sauna session, if I may, in that you you don't really have these big five year or 10 year goals. Like you're like, you're really present and you navigate by being present. For me, I'm, I, re- I maybe that's one of the reasons why you resonate with each other. Cause I, I do the same. Mm-hmm. I don't have, I never use like Pomodoro techniques or productivity tools. Like I'm really present and I've gotten really good at noticing what needs to be done. And it's a really, um, step-by-step process. What I actually, you know what, you know, what just occurred to me? I'm really good at being clear and I'm really good at noticing when I'm not clear. When I have, when I have too much on my mind, I have too over, I'm thinking too far ahead. Like, okay, I need to just take a step back. Mm-hmm. What is the thing that's in front of you that needs the most attention? And I've learned that there's a system within us that we can rely on to let us know what, what's important. And it's more clear when I'm clear, but when I'm not clear with myself and things are fuzzy, there's, there's too much noise. I know it's really hard to, to do good work and bringing it back to Taekwondo is if you go into any, like this relates to all combat sports, any sport, any competitive sports, if you go into any sport and you start thinking too far ahead, you're going to have a bad day because you're not going to pay attention to what's in front of you. Mm. Right. If you're like every interview, any Olympic Taekwondo athletes, like how do you plan for your sessions? Like, well, I go and watch my, the, my opponent for a bit and then I can get it kind of get a feel for them but when I'm playing I really have to be focused on the present moment if I planned out the whole session and the moment things don't go according to plan I'm fucked interesting yeah and then even in chess you know chess is a very planning type of game Mm -hmm. you still have to get a feel for the game and like okay and you can kind of see moves ahead but at most, it's probably five or six. Like you can't plan out the whole game before it happens. Well, I was just going to mention chess because I'm a bit obsessed as well. And very often, I plan out a few moves ahead. And I have this grand vision of what I'm going to do. And then I miss a blunder that's just in front of me. And that's where I yeah. lose the game. I, I, who, I don't know who said it. I wonder if it's Mike Tyson who said it. Everybody has a plan until I get punched in the face. <laughs> that sounds like him. Yeah. And life, life is a contact sport. Life will knock you on your ass. And in my world, we say we don't care how smart, how big or grand you are, life will bitch slap you at some point. And knowing how to handle those is really important. And for me, I, I have a story. I was talking to a client the other day and, and bless his heart, he's young, he's working in tech. And he was really worried that he wasn't able to be productive nine to five. Like, I like, I don't know if that works for me. Should I like leave my job? And like, he was really worried about it. And I said, Mm -hmm. nobody is productive nine to five. Like, where'd you get that? It's like, well, like that, isn't that what they do in like real business and corporate? I'm like, no, I'm not productive nine to five. I'm productive, like maybe two hours at a time. And the rest of the time I need to take a break, go for a walk. And then I'm productive another two hours at a time. And he said, and it was like writing down two hours at a time. Like, no, no, don't do that. You've missed the point. The point is to listen to how you work. There's a system and like, there's a very natural way that we all work. And the point is to listen to that. I agree with that. It's tough for me to, to, to power through more than two, three hours. Yeah. Even three hours is tough. Like yeah. I have to break down my days, but that's why I don't mind working. And I think we talked about it. Like I don't mind extending my work days. Like yeah. sometimes I'll feel more productive in the morning, sometimes more productive in the afternoon. It's also cyclical, right? You can't predict it basically. And that's why working a nine to five for people like us is almost impossible because we yeah. feel like, well, we have I don't know. I feel like I'm lying to my boss saying I'm being productive this whole time. Whereas maybe I'd rather work at night or whatever. 
Yeah, I think there's a great quote, I think, by Tad Hardgrave, who said, like, we're, we're not machines, like, humans are not machines, we are very biological, no, we are biological creatures, but we're not, like, we're more like gardens, we're like, there's some seasons where we're really productive, there's some seasons where we're not, and it's really important to listen to that, if you take, if you look at anything in nature, like, take a bear, a bear hibernates, like, if you make a bear do nine to five, you're gonna have a really hard time with that bear. You know, like um, things that like spring in nature, spring is when everything happens and summer and then winter things kind of shut down for a bit. Like people, we have rhythms like that. And I feel like a lot of the problems we're experiencing mentally come from being unnatural. Working nine to five is normal, but it's not natural to our bio rhythms and sleep and things like that. Some people are really active at night. I'm really active at night. And like uh, one of my clients, he said in Thailand, he said, you know, you're the only coach I know who's going to take a call at 11 at night. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm, I'm awake at 11. And that's why you, you won't find me at 9 a.m. Because that's not going to happen. <laughs> What's your window of operation? And that doesn't mean you're productive the whole time. But I'm just curious, when do you start being in front of a computer if that's how you get you know, into work? And so, when do you end? So for me, I would say... For going back to what needs to be done, if I need to be in front of a computer, I'll be in front of a computer if it's 9 a.m. Or, or 10 or whatever. But I would say my peak times are 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Wow. That's, that's when I'll sit and just plow through a lot of work and like peak productivity. And I know that now. So I know to schedule stuff at that time. And I've you have clients in the U.S. as well, so that kind of makes yes, sense. Yes, yeah. And I've and I've recently found that was a premise like, oh, no Thai people, like no Asian clients are going to work with me at that night. Turns out, all like the younger group of people, like some businesses will hire me to do people transformation, and part of that is working one on ones with their younger team. All those guys are like 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 9 p.m., and they're all bright and sparkly. And I'm like, all right, found my people. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. So okay, ah. Uh, just going back to my original question, though, because this is very interesting, like how you navigate it all. But how do you split your time in the sense that like, w like you can give me a breakdown, either what brings you money or what spend, uh, what y uses sure, your sure. time the most? Like, I'm just curious how your week breaks down in, in, in terms of the different things you're working on. Sure. So my week breakdowns, um, I would say the take with no business is the most structured. So there are set times for all the international schools, all their um, session times, like that's all laid out internally with my team and my teams take care of that. So I learned from the better founders actually to how to really not just delegate, but to grow leaders. Mm -hmm. I was really overwhelmed in one mastermind session and someone listened to me and like their, their advice or wonder for me. It's like, oh, I wonder if you, who's your CEO? And I'm like, I'm the CEO, like my ego. And I was like, oh, I need to build another CEO. And so when I built that CEO, I had more time and my team quickly realized, I, and this was in a real meeting, they said, you know what, guys, I've learned that when Nikon has more free time, we all seem to make more money. For some reason, he connects with people and they end up knowing somebody at an international school and we get more clients. So he said, our job is to make Nikon have more free time. Mm. And, and that happened in the business, like slowly went up because I started connecting. I realized my gift is connecting and doing is doing sales and just growing relationships and that Nikon being in operations is like the worst thing that can happen. But that, 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 that came from trying stuff and from me trying being operations and watching myself slowly die in operations. Mm, and so I have, a, I have a lot of free time on my calendar. And then, so in terms of money, I would say that Taekwondo business pays the bills. And I learned this from my aunt. She calls it her nut. So you have your, your base, your, your cost covered and your bills, and it allows me to try cool stuff with coaching to like go for the bigger clients or to go for like bigger paydays and, and not having to worry about paying my bills has been the best thing I've ever done. Like pay, doing work that pays your bills may not be sexy. It may not be cool, but having that mental, not having to worry about it mentally it gives you that creativity and inspiration to do really cool shit in your other businesses that might be harder, higher risk, but you're not worrying about your rent or your food or your, you know, your family. Mm. Yeah. They call it, I, I, some people call it sexy projects and unsexy projects. 
Mon money projects pay the bills. Sexy projects are like cool shit that you've always wanted to try. Okay, and so then, Taekwondo pays the bills. Coaching yeah. is where you experiment. Experiment. I try stuff. Like, um, and then, yeah, to coach, like Taekwondo is also paid for all of my coaching education. It's paid for all of my mentors. And I see it as a symbiotic relationship. The, co the Taekwondo business invests in me. And in return, I, I become a better leader for that Taekwondo business. So it's become this really cool relationship. And... For coaching, I have a Calendly. And so with coaching business, and you know this, because you can set your calendar, I can really choose when people can connect with me one-on-one. -on -one. And then when I have like certain jobs come in, like two-day offsites for corporate or things I want to do, or like I have a two-day immersion where I spend two days with people and we just go deep, like I'm able to clear my schedule and for things like that. So it's very flexible and very, it feels like alive, Tim. It feels like whatever comes in, things shift to make it happen. And speaking to you now, I realize that that's what I've always wanted in my life. A very flexible schedule where I feel free. I love it as well. Um, it doesn't, it's funny because people might assume that it means we're lazy or whatnot because, you know, we're flexible. We want the free time to do nothing. But actually, I find myself working more than other people because of this flexibility. First of all, you have to have kind of a, a drive to give yourself work. You're flexible, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we need money to survive, right? So we still have to do stuff. Uh, it's just a completely different mindset and lifestyle, I guess. It's not suited for everyone. And if, um, if I may, I learned this from a mentor. Is we never need motivation or drive to do the things we actually want to do. And the metaphor was, I have, I, I have never needed motivation to eat ice cream or pizza. That is never, that is never, no one's ever going to need to motivate me to do that. And yeah, you can talk about that. Well, we can talk about pizza and ice cream for sure. But what I really appreciate is that, you know, we're in this better founder group um, yeah. that you created. And every time I open the chat, I'm amazed how many quotes people can remember. Like I... Mm. I love quotes and I abide by them, I guess, but I could not recite a quote for the life of me. And you just, you know, threw a three or four in, in this one, like 30 minute conversation so far. And I'm like, wow, do you just like memorize them? Do you write them on a notepad? Like, how do you re remember quotes like that? I have a, like, that's my secret hobby. I, I love quotes. So I collect them yeah. and I put them all on my Google do. sheet. Yeah, I, I collect them. I, I genuinely collect them because I love I love, I call them inner sparks. That's the name of my company, actually. These little sparks that you're like, oh, there, there's some truth in that. Like, mm -hmm. I want to keep that. And I think as a yeah. teacher, as a teacher um, or, or coach, like, I, I like to share them with the people I'm with or with things like this because they're, they're cool. Like, I can't recite poetry or like uh, Shakespeare, but I can recite quotes. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, just one thing before I forget on your LinkedIn profile here, you're also managing partner at what I assume Gormley Glass is your dad's yeah. business. So right. are you involved with that or you were right. at some point? I, that's a fun story. I, when I, when I graduated university, I went right to work for the family business and I got fired within a month. <laughs> wow. What happened? Uh, I was young, arrogant, um, kind of hurt, like I was in a rush to like prove myself. So I came in with all these changes and everything I wanted to do to make the business better. And I forgot that people have egos, you know, I have an ego and, and I was like, like, I did not know how to communicate change. I didn't know how to influence change. I was just like, this is wrong. I'm right. Which telling that to the business founder is just, is that that's never going to work. I didn't know how to get buy in. I didn't know how to make that work. And then, so I got away from that family business for a long time. And then finally, uh, my father, they asked me, Oh, can you just be a part of it in some capacity? Let us have access to you when we want to ask you questions or, or support. And, and now it's more, I would say, and we're, I'm just, I just do it. If there are things that I can do, that would be helpful. And they say, Hey, Nikon, we need your help with this. Like I'll do it. And if for me, do you ever coach? I have a coach your dad now that you're a coach. I'm curious how that goes. God, no. <laughs> That'd be like the last client <laughs> ever. But you know what? I will say this. I've learned to listen to my father a lot more. 
And if anything, I would say my biggest asset to the family business is my ability to listen. If anything, I am, I am probably the best sounding board in that whole organization. I've had conversations with my father where I've sat and listened for two hours and I didn't say a thing. And my father would say, like he would just get like he would just get clear. He would talk about everything he has on his plate, and then, and then through through I guess listening to himself talk it out, he'd be like, oh, okay, now I'm gonna do that, and then things would work out. And I thought to myself, well, I, if this is the if this is my main value here, then like cool, I'll do that. I'll be a great listener. It's so funny that you say that because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. I coach a few founders in Southeast Asia right now, and I always thought coaching them, they would really want to learn about some of the strategies that I implemented for scaling startups and whatnot. And it turns out that nine out of 10 times, they enjoy the idea of talking to me about their problems and they come up with solutions on their own. And I'm just sitting there wondering, like, um, I mean, I feel really wrong charging you for this because... I didn't give you any ideas or I said like a couple of things that guided the conversation and you did all the rest. And they're like, no, I'm super, like, I'm really happy right now. Like, thank you so much for this. And I'm like, wow, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird, but I guess it's every coach. Well, I can, I can speak to that if you're interested. I can tell you exactly why that's powerful. Sure. Love to so hear. the truth is, Tim, most people aren't listened to in their life ever. Like we, we're, we're in a fast moving world. People are very interested in their own opinions and in their own thoughts and their own advices. Very rarely do we get to spend time with people who genuinely listen to us, who like genuinely listen to us. I think people are usually more listened to when they're a child, when people are just fascinated by your little bright energy and they don't care if you're like, you're showing them their, like your drawing that looks like shit, but like, it's like to them, it's like, wow, this is, that's amazing. Like really, you know? It, it, it's that very pure energy. And for me, the, the second piece to this puzzle and value, value, value proposition, like is grounding. It's that your, your calm listening presence allows them to calm down. And when they calm down, their clarity goes up. And what they really need is clarity to see more clearly what they're doing, what their challenges are, what their opportunities are that clarity is what moves the needle and that so i think you have yeah, yeah. where their shower basically yeah and that's like you know in my in my world we call it rain we show up and we rain love attention listening empathy mm. kindness and they're the soil and we care not if nothing fucking grows because they're like they're rocks but people like when when it rains you might get little sprouts i and was that, thinking more in the sense that when everything you described earlier is exactly how I feel in the shower. And that's when I have my best ideas. Exactly. So I was like, well, I guess I am your shower. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and there's this safety in a coach and talking to someone like you as a young founder who like, like there's this trust that you're going to, you're going to tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're there to tell them the truth, whether you're like, yep, you're, you're totally an asshole in this situation. Like, and they're like, oh, okay, yes, I, I will listen to that because I've, I've paid you to listen to you. Right. I think there's, there's not, I think I know there's that trust. There's that trust. Having someone on your team who's willing to give it to you straight is incredibly rare. And you know, as being a founder, I, it took me five years to train my team to tell me the app, like the truth, even when I don't want to hear it. And in big one, I, yeah. In big I mean, or, a lot of your team is Thai, I suppose, right? Yeah, they're all Thai. They're all used it's to even like, harder in Southeast Asia. Harder. Right. So I told my team, like, I'm paying you to tell me the truth. Give it to mm -hmm. me when it's hard. And they're like, are you like, really? And I'm like, I'm not going to get fired. And I'm like, no, if anything, I'll probably promote you. And so we just have a lot of direct communication. And that's a big problem in most organizations where like people are just afraid to tell each other the truth. They don't know how to have those difficult conversations. I think, I don't know if this is true or not, but I read in one article that most problems in startups come from people not having difficult conversations. I think that's very true. That's very true. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about growth a little bit, because as you know, growing businesses is my specialty, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or I like to believe so. So because you have so many things going on, I'm going to ask you if you can focus on one of the businesses and tell me 
what you're struggling with in terms of growing that business. Um, and again, maybe I'm jumping the gun here because you you like to live sure. like kind of week by week and you're just slow sure, sure. process type of guy. But maybe there are some things that you've been struggling with. And I, I'd love to like kind of live give you some reactions or feedback. Sure. Um, I'm thinking, let me, let me think of one, one thing that might be helpful. Um, mm -mm -mm. Okay. I think the, the oh, I have, I have a few options that we could look That's at. Cool. Okay. There's, there's the um, take one, no business, which is like mature. And that, that, that area of growth is more is how do we play a bigger game in that? Do we expand in more schools? Do we, do we turn into more of a franchise? Like how, like there's that. And there's the coaching business where I want to play the game of like more, um, one to many where, whereby like, I think I spent nine years doing one-on-ones, but now it's starting to be one to many. And how do I, and my questions in that area are how do I create better programs or more um, how do I scale myself? Because in the coaching, it's I'm scaling myself, my my impact and the, the amount of people I want to work with. So we can go the coaching route or the the taekwondo business. Um, I mean, I can talk about both, but I think like the coaching business is is more interesting to me. <laughs> Not because I like I actually love taekwondo, and I want to talk to you about it because my wife is Korean, and I after you described it as like this education format thing i'm like i'm putting my kids into taekwondo but that's yeah. that's beyond the point the reason i say the coaching thing is is is, is, is interesting is because it's quite relevant to what i'm building right now mm -hmm. and so i might have more feedback for you than um for the taekwondo which is very brick and mortar and i'm i'm very like online type of guy so the first thing i notice is that um you want to do one to many and i think you know talking about funnels uh, the first thing you need to make sure is how, are you recognized as sort of an expert in your field and i know you're doing talks yeah. here you have the better founder you have this and that and I'm, I'm sure you have a lot more initiatives but one thing i'm noticing is like your clientele is b2b obviously like most likely a lot of companies are hiring you and b2b's basically live on linkedin um and when yeah. i open your linkedin i'm expecting as a as a coach to see a lot of content about your expert experience expertise but um i'm noticing that you're actually not extremely active and that your content is not engaging as much mm. on linkedin so there's definitely a huge opportunity there and mm. for me i've seen like my linkedin strategy is what basically brings me all of my business and i'd love to sit down with you and kind of review what sure. you're doing wrong what you're doing right and kind of uh make some adjustments there because i think it like the first thing for you should should be like create a top of funnel on linkedin where you become an authority figure and the type of transformative coaching that you offer mm -hmm. um and then like down the funnel like i think at the bottom of the funnel is what you're currently offering which is one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching or, or one-to-many coaching but in person sort of via corporations and that's the high ticket item but in between there's so many things you can be offering from like what we call lead magnets to tripwires to then programs and all of which have like an ascending uh ticket price um so like one of them I, I i read about this company recently they're called pip decks do you know them it's like a kind of a coaching uh, card uh, card game. If you haven't heard of them, I'll send you the, the name. It's the P-I-P-D-E-C-K-S dot com. They have a really good product. And essentially, it's like a very low ticket coaching uh, uh, product that you can be selling. Once you've already established your authority as, as a person, you could create uh, a small um, value bringing game or value bringing item whether it's a, a PDF, a white paper, whatever, that you can either give out for free or sell to kind of create a, a, a funnel, you know, not, not just top of funnel, but you start getting leads in, et cetera. Uh, but then like one thing that I, I think it, it would be interesting for us to collaborate on, at least to discuss is because I'm building my own program, which is mm -hmm. sort of like higher ticket. It's not like high ticket in the sense you're making several thousands per client per month but it's more like in the five to six hundred dollars a month ticket which is really mid-range 
And, and I think that's something you could build as well, which is it's a self-serve program where all of your education and all of your knowledge is accessible as well as like group coaching. Like you have weekly calls, you have access to you or to the community. And that's what, what I'm building for myself. And I think it's applicable to all sorts of knowledge bases, including your type of transformative coaching. So I think that's the funnel you should kind of look at. Uh, but what you're missing right now is the top of funnel. I know you're doing conferences and things like that. So you're already building your name in the, in the sphere, but we need a way to channel it and to um, amplify it online. And I think LinkedIn would be a really good place to start. So I'd be happy to kind of give you some, some yeah, tips there. That's really, it's funny you say that because I was thinking about the very similar thing. So I'm always like, what I really like about you is your, like your natural curiosity and certainty with that. And I can see why a lot of founders want to spend time with you because I can sense that you're not full of shit. Like, there, you know, that's the thing going back to that other thing. Like, I don't know what you call it. I think what sets you apart is this, um, you know what posturing is? Posturing? Yeah. So like pretending it, uh, to be something or whatever. The posturing is, um, um, the way I've under, the uh, way I've learned this in marketing posturing is some people, like lean in too heavy and they're really hypey and like they're they're really like yeah. intent and like when you lean into people like people's natural reaction is like to lean back like right. like they're way too hypey but you have a very calm grounded like very like um balanced where it's like it's more approachable because you're not leaning in too heavy it's just just something that i noticed off of listening to you and to what you said absolutely you know one idea i had and you're right like i need to solve more problems on LinkedIn for my clients, like just solve pro pro like private sure. questions publicly and getting into a rhythm of doing that. And like having a podcast, like, um, like a short, like not an interview podcast, but, um, a, a solo podcast where it's like five to eight minutes. So I had these ideas and having, maybe having someone bounce ideas off will help me to get, get it going. And also one thing I love that my mentor did, uh, Michael Neal, I call them like M&Ms and they're like $15 courses. And it's like three videos on, and it's three videos on like a whole new way of thinking about anxiety, a whole new way of thinking about people transformation. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if I sat down and just looked at the tech logistics of that behind the house, where do I upload the videos? How do people, I, I, I can guide you through all of that. That's, that's what you call your tripwire. I think so that, that's that was, like very yeah. small ticket, but then you get people that are actually interested in your product and are willing to pay. And then you can upsell them to a lot of different right. things. And and very similar to you and where I resonate, like what was holding me back before was like, I wanted to be perfect. I want the studio lighting. I need all this. Mm -hmm. I'm just realizing like I could like use my Yeti microphone with this. I actually, like, I bought like a, a Sony camera. I could just do that and like for fifth for $10. For like a three a three part series on one specific topic, like I could do that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then put that out there, be like, hey, and I, for me, what another way of saying what you're saying is, um, psychologically, it's, you're lowering risk. And a lot of problems with like coaches is like, hi, how are you? I'm Tim. Great. You want to work with me? It's fifty thousand dollars, and you're like, I don't know you, but I learn. I learn from like being a customer or consumer of this content is there's something about spending a little bit of money and spending time with people over time. And it builds that internal trust where it's like, I think now with like my teacher, uh, Michael Neal, or even Mavis Card, they could do a course on ABCs for like a hundred dollars. I'm like, sure, here, like I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But it's, it's the really, another thing I like about what you're saying is you're, you're hinting at building a relationship rather than, I'm going to manipulate you psychologically to get the most money out of you quickly. It's like, here are some ways for people can, who can build, here are some ways for people to build relationship with you over the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's so when I talk about a funnel, by the way, like it's not in purely marketing, like you said, trying to squeeze as much money as possible. It's yeah. more like you bring value at every point of the funnel, but some people are willing and interested in getting more and more value out of you, which has a price tag. That's all it is. Right, right, right. And then what I love about um, another way I see forward, like building this great funnel or just building this great value ladder is, is um, I call it the, the 
evergreen, right? Once you put the course out there, it's a three part, it doesn't have to be a big course, it's $10, it's three videos, and it's just always there in rotation and people, and like how cool, I, I would love to do that. If I get that sorted out, I think that would definitely help me grow my business because I'm not it's hitting the point where I'm noticing there are only so many conferences you can do. There are only so many talks you can because you know it takes a lot of time and energy. And it's I don't know about you. Know, it's not stable. It takes time to it takes me a day to recover. I need to go to the sauna. I need to relax. Mm -hmm. Like like it takes a lot of energy because you give so much of yourself to Yeah. You know, I learned that I came back from Prague doing at a world listening conference. And I was a speaker there and I came back and I hit the ground running to him. I did not slow down. I did not stop. I did not take a break. And I kind of like, I had a mini burnout. I was like, I'm so tired. So taking care, you're right. Definitely taking care of those funnels mm. would be a great boost. And I'll, I'll definitely, and that's one of my biggest key takeaways from this conversation. I love it. Well, I've had a lot of great takeaways from this conversation. And before we part ways, is there anything that you want to shout out to? Personal or professional? Sure. While I'm at it, <laughs> I, so for me, one of the things, there are two things, two shout outs. One thing I'm really interested right now in my business is doing people transformation for, I guess, more mature businesses who, and, and I've, I've defined the problem statement. The problem statement is you're a leader and your business is growing and you realize you need to grow the capacity of your team to meet the capacity needs of your business. And the question is, how do you raise the bar of your whole team? And I would love to help you solve that problem. I would love to help your people really be more aligned with like where their best comes from. And for you as a leader to know where your best comes from so that you can help your team. That's the first shout out. And I'm really interested in that. And I'd love to collaborate with you on things like that and bring you in as a teacher or guest speaker in programs I do for corporates because I think it's really, 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 really important. And the second thing I want to shout out is at the end of August in 2024, I'm doing a two-day leadership immersion. And I would say it's a very insightful conversation like this over two days. And I heard a mentor talk about it, Aaron Turner, and that there's something cool that happens when you bring people together And they're listening in a very pure way. Like they're not being trained. They're not, they're not trying to learn something, but they're just really present and they're sharing insights with a facilitated gui guidance. There's no, there's not a destination, but there's a direction. And to watch people uncover insights that will move everything forward. And that's, that's what I'm really excited about right now. Love it. All right, I'll make sure to point to different things you mentioned in the uh, in the about section or the description. Uh, and thank you so much, Nikon, for showing up. I really appreciate the conversation as usual. And that's it. That's the pod. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Cool. All right. I stopped.